What are you? My kind have no names, but you humans call me Goliath. Your kind? Gargoyles has a comic book series. Well, it's had a few, but as of late 2022 moving forward, it has Gargoyles Season 4, which has an interesting history and it's meant to be a canon continuation of the series, but only Seasons 1 and 2. Greg Weissman doesn't want to talk about the Goliath Chronicles, except for the first episode, which he wrote before Disney removed him. This because he stated he was concerned about the latest season's direction and having his creativity stifled. Oh yes, there's much behind the scenes intrigue leading up to this comic. It's been a journey to get to this iteration of Gargoyles, and that intrigued me. Dynamite was kind enough to send this to me and the more I looked into the history surrounding how it came to be, the more I wanted to talk about it. So here we are. I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and we're gonna take a look at Gargoyles issue one, a tiny bit of issue two, and mostly how we got to Gargoyles season four in the first place. The one on the covers you'll see, of course, is called Disney's Gargoyles. They're licensing it out. The plan was perfect. Plan. It would have succeeded. What plan? Gargoyles was a Disney animated series which ran from 1994 to 1997 and consisted of three seasons and 78 episodes, with the episode division being season one, 13 episodes, season two, 52 episodes, and season three, back to 13. A downgrade. That third season is the season that got axed from the comics canon. The series did decently well at the time, but has a very strong fan base, almost a cult level fan base. And it's often praised for being much more mature than other Disney cartoons, both at the time and in general. And some just feel that regardless of that, it's just a solid cartoon series on its own with compelling characters, plot lines, memorable performances, and with an eye catching look. Some compare it favorably to Batman the animated series. This is hardly a surprising comparison, especially at the start, because much of the first season was written by BTS writers. As the series went on, the writing staff would Expand, especially in the second season, which contains a whole going around the world arc. And by the third season, there had been much changeover. Few of the original writers were left. Many of the changes, and changes also occurred in the animation production staff, occurred because of internal power struggles inside of Disney. These resulted in most of the people who had been supportive of the Gargoyles project moving on. So by season three, there really wasn't much internal support at the upper levels. This is the Cliff Notes, and there are many interesting videos about what happened specifically surrounding the show at this period in Disney's history. It's just an interesting historical period for Disney in general. General, which leads to the formation of DreamWorks and the rivalry between those two. There are also some who chart the decline of Gargoyles from back in season two when it started to be preempted for the OJ Simpson trial. It's just all very interesting. But we need to get to the comics, which also have a storied history. One of the producers and creators of Gargoyles, Greg Weissman, is the writer of our 2022 series, though he didn't have a writing credit on the original animated series until season three, that being the first episode of that series, but he was always an integral part of the creative process and one of the series' biggest fans. Some of you may recognize the name from the animated series Young Justice, and he was always quick to jump at a chance to keep working on Gargoyles and keep the universe and characters alive. In 2020, he stated, Gargoyles is still my baby. I don't own it. I don't get a dime off it being on Disney+, Plus, and yet I'm thrilled that it is. I'm thrilled that it represents a chance, even if it's a slim chance to bring it back. I've always wanted to do more. I've got a timeline for the show that's 315 pages long. I've got notebooks and comp books full of ideas for it, spin-off notions and all sorts of things. Literally nothing would make me happier than to go back and do more Gargoyles. attempt at a Gargoyles series comes from the licensing out to Marvel Comics. This ran from February to December of 1995. So this was a testing of the waters in tie-in territory because this is coming out while the animated series is still airing. The comic features some very 90s Amanda Connor art, which is cool to see when compared to her style now. The series was written by Martin Pascoe and Mort Todd, and was cancelled due to low sales, meaning that it was left on a permanent cliffhanger at issue 11. Weissman was actually hired to write for this comic, but Marvel cut ties with Disney and the deal fell through before he got a chance to write for them officially. He already had a script written in every Thing. And eventually, years later, he would find a place to use it. That year, 2006, when Slave Labor Graphics, in association with Creature Comics, got the license for Gargoyles, with Weissman on board to write. Weissman approached the series as the direct canonical continuation of Gargoyles, the animated series. Except he chose to ignore everything from the Goliath Chronicles onward, except for the one episode he wrote entitled The Journey. That episode would then comprise the first two issues of the comic series. When asked about his feelings in the third season in general, he stated somewhat saltily, this is in response to an anonymous fan question. One must assume he was asked this question a lot or there's just still salt about how everything went down with that series but here's the response you couldn't have looked too carefully and you clearly didn't check the faq because i've answered this over and over and over i don't consider it canon how i'd account for it would depend on the nature of a new pickup but my current inclination is to ignore it and answer any questions on the internet but i'm not committed to that approach he was definitely committed to that approach and in this series where he got to ignore the goliath chronicles he also got to use his previously unused script this he used for issue six and that poor issue in the first run it had a massive art error inside of it 
The art for pages 12 and 16 was transposed with each other, and so they later had to have that issue reprinted. Ooh, it would probably be worth a decent amount to have one of the error issues, like having one of the issues where they didn't shade out Batman's Wing Wong. This is what the monetization does to you on YouTube. You start using things like Wing Wong. For that 2006 series, cover art was handled by animated series designer Greg Guller, alongside Stephanie Lestimolo. So how long did this one last? 12 issues, and one spinoff, which we'll get to in a moment. Weissman stated in 2008 that Disney had increased the licensing fees, and so slave labor graphics would not be renewing the license. And so it sat for a while until 2015, where there was almost our Gargoyle series. This one, Aaron Sparrow announced that Joe Books Inc. was going to make a Sinistory comic series adapting Gargoyle, starting with the five-part intro episode Awakening. This was supposed to come out in 2016, but in 2017, Joe Books confirmed that it had indeed been cancelled. And that brings us to 2022 and Dynamite. They enter the picture and acquire the license. Once more, Greg Weissman is helming the series, and it will continue on from the 2006 series, with that series acting as the official season three, again, ignoring the Goliath Chronicles. That slave labor graphic series is set to be re-released by Dynamite. As well as the spin off Gargoyles Bad Guys, which initially appeared as a six issue black and white spin off from the first SLG run in 2007 and 2008. So hopefully nobody sold kidneys to get copies of it off of eBay. Weissman was thrilled to be returning to the series and was quick to outline his approach for how he was going to go about it. He stated, I've never really left the Gargoyles universe. I spent a lot of time there. I really feel I know all the characters intimately still. I did feel a bit rusty at first, though I have to admit, at weaving the storylines together, specifically for a comic book. An individual issue is equivalent to one act of a three act television episode, so I had some mental adjustments to make, but I like to think I got it licked. Issue number one of the new Gargoyles comic from Dynamite is set a few months after the last SLG issue. When asked about how slash what he would change for the series since it was 2022, he stated, Nothing. We just want to do more. We also want this to be an opportunity for new fans to find and fall in love with the property. So this new series won't assume that everyone reading has an encyclopedic knowledge of every episode or past comic book issue. We'll reintroduce every concept from the series as needed when needed and hope that we hook them. So there's the goal. More gargoyles, expanding the universe, keeping the same tone, but also hoping to hook new fans as well as old. So with all of that in mind, how's it going? Gargoyles number one is written by, as mentioned, the ever-passionate Greg Weissman, with art by George Combatis. And it is dynamite, so there are a variety of covers to choose from. This one is my favorite. It's the David Nakayama one. It's just very intense. I like it. Our story opens in Manhattan with Elisa Maza, who is going to serve as our narrator for this issue and is going to catch everyone up, including on who she is, an NYPD detective. Her and her partner, Matt Bluestone, and his amazing name are chasing down some ATM bandits. When their arrest is assisted by none other than Gargoyles. Chapter one of the story is entitled A Little Crazy. After the Gargoyles help after and the criminals, Elisa goes to see Goliath. And for the next several pages, we get light but also necessary exposition. Their clan was frozen in stone by a magic spell for a thousand years. Now here in Manhattan, the spell is broken and they live again. They are defenders of the night. They are, well, you get the idea. There's a couple of Batman jokes in here. There's another one later by Goliath himself when he says that criminals are a superstitious and cowardly lot and then they make a Cape Crusader joke. We then get a detail to us what the relationship status between characters is, as well as being introduced to the rest of the gargoyles. And Brooklyn's mate Katana, he met her in Fuel Japan. Don't ask. I'll ask what I want to ask. And Goliath's daughter Angela, she and I are like sisters. Not as weird as it sounds. After the intros, our next bit of exposition is about the state of gangs in New York. The head of a powerful crime family, the Dracone family, well, he's been put away as has his rival, Tomas Brode. So there's now a power struggle, a vacuum in the city. Matt and I busted them both, with a little help from the gargoyles. Okay, with a lot of help from the gargoyles. We made them share a cell because we thought it would be funny. That sounds like a terrible idea. Only bad things can come of that. It's all fun and games until somebody kills somebody else or an alliance is formed or you get cited for negligence. Cold stone and cold fire. He's a zombie cyborg, she's a robot. Each harbors the soul of a gargoyle from Goliath's Scottish clan. I realize that sounds pretty complicated, but trust me, it's all you really need to know. Coldstone and Cold Fire provide a break in Elisa's narration, as they are shown to be trying to mitigate the power grabs left in the wake of the shift in Mafia power in the city. But they are also shown to have conflicting views with Goliath as to what they're doing and how they're going about it. Why they have to keep themselves hidden from the humans? Why they have to help them at all? Things like that. Goliath is striving for one day when the time is right for there to be harmony between gargoyles and humans. Others, like Coldstone, have more bitterness. Coldstone sounds like a beer to me. Was there a beer called Coldstone? I'm gonna look it up. If there is, I'll insert it. Hello. Editing me from the future. No to beer, but yes to an ice cream place. The next call Elisa receives isn't from her partner about the state of the city, but from her brother Derek. Another complicated story, as she says. One that involves a mad scientist injecting him with some kind of mutagenic formula that was part panther, part bat, part eel. He's half panther, half bat, half eel. He's been thoroughly spliced. And he became a mutate called Talon and found an underground community, the Labyrinth. They're totally not Morlocks, kinda. They got mutates. 
outsiders, gargoyle clones. His partner Maggie is about to give birth, which is why he's calling. But we also see that there's a traitor in their midst. Someone else reporting that the child is about to be born to her shadowy villainous boss who wants the child and claims that soon, it'll be an orphan. And with that, the sun is set to rise, so the gargoyles must rest for the day. With the promise that next issue, there will be a lot of crazy. So issue one. This comic is a very quick read, and much of that is taken up by the exposition. Which, while it's doing its best to not be dry or clunky, because it's inserting little humorous quips inside of itself, which Miles will vary, it is a bit heavy to get through. Some of its own concerns expressed in the quote from earlier in the video about pacing, they do play out in this first issue, but it does appear that as it goes on, that does even out. But his concerns about that were valid. However, if one is new to the series, or didn't read the prior season 3 from SLG, or it may just have been a while since you've checked in with the show, it can and does prove very helpful. And despite how clunky it is, they are trying to keep it minimal. It could have been a lot more info dumpy. The first issue does its best to set up conflicts that will play out and quickly set up relationship dynamics in a clear manner so that going forward they can be more fleshed out. But on the whole, the first issue is a lot of setup, and Miles is going to vary on how that lands. There's also the potential for the narration boxes to oversell how complicated some of the things that they are explaining are. Because really they are explaining things quite succinctly, but at times it comes across like there's almost a sheepishness to all of the backstory that is present. Which miles will vary. Some will feel that yes, it is a lot of a lot, while others will feel that no, what's being detailed are little teasers, crumbs, there's no need to go on about how it's complicated. For some, this will be an exciting easing back into the world, or it'll just be exciting to see these characters again and see them in action. But if something about this issue doesn't hook you, it may not be enough to keep one invested. This is trying to be for new fans as well as old, but the gearing of it just by its nature is more towards older fans. But that doesn't mean you can't hook new ones with this format. Admittedly, Gargoyles was something I missed the boat on when I was younger. As mentioned in another video, I didn't get the Disney Channel. And as I grew up, it wasn't a series that was on my watch list. Even though I had several people tell me that I'd probably like it, if I liked Batman TAS, I should give this a chance. And then years later, when retrospectives and things became something on YouTube, there were always and still are tons of gargoyles. Retrospective gargoyles are the best. You can go and find them. But for me, I never really got to it, aside from watching a bunch of clips and the first five episodes, Awakening. So that's the perspective I was coming into this comic with. Noob. And coming into that from that perspective, this comic made me feel like I should give this series another go. Over the cyborgs and the mutates. Seems like it got wild in a way I would enjoy. So some of the elements made me want to keep going and potentially look into the older material. Panther, bat, Eel. Come on. I'm invested in that and the missing baby, more so than the gang warfare. But that's just me. For longtime fans, I can see this being a real treat just to see the series return and potentially have more patience for some of the setup that's being laid out here. Or the opposite, just get to the meat. But either way, it is nice to see the series helmed by someone so passionate about the franchise. Unless you were a diehard Goliath Chronicles fan, that is. Is it worth continuing on to issue two? I'd say so. I'd say that because they very much dealt with most of the exposition in issue one. And so issue two gets to be a lot more character based. And as a result, it's just a more focused and more nuanced and dense ride. From starting off with Angela's conflicted nightmares about her mother's anger and her own newfound happiness, to the baby napping and expanding upon what's going on with the Dracone family, it really picks up in the second issue. And you get an interview at the end of the second one, which I'm always a fan of. It's interesting to read the different perspectives that the creators are coming into it with, and in this issue you get to hear from the artist a lot. If you're a Gargoyles fan, these are definitely worth your time. And if you're not, but you're curious, this could be a cool place to dive in if you're not one who's troubled by filling in the blanks as you go. However, if you weren't a fan of Gargoyles, or they didn't seem interesting to you, especially with how the first issue is so rapid fire, almost bullet point in its exposition, it may not sway you or be appealing to those crowds. Had not become invested in Talon and the potential kidnap baby plot, I would likely not have returned for issue two. But that was there, and so here I am. This work's first love is clearly the Gargoyles universe itself, and that comes through. But those are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. Is this something that you're interested in? Are you reading it? How does it land for you if you're a longtime fan, casual fan, new reader? If you're super familiar with the characters, are they on point? Because that's another thing that could be off-putting for some people if they're not, if they feel radically out of character. So I want to hear from you. Tell me things down below while you're down there. Please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.